Hey everyone! Today, we have something very special to talk about. We have a T-Rex! But let's go ahead and cut right to the chase. This is the most famous animal to ever live. Whether you are on Team Predator or Team Scavenger, there's no debating that the T-Rex is an all-star. That's why this video isn't just about any T-Rex, this video is about my favorite T-Rex and how its discovery completely changed our understanding of how this animal actually lived. No, it's not a boy named Sue, it's the Y-Rex. Y-Rex? How should I know? I thought that's what this video was supposed to be about. The Y-Rex is a nearly complete T-Rex fossil discovered in 2004 on the Y-Rex Ranch in Baker, Montana. Oh, I get it now. Why for Y-Rex Ranch? Finding a new T-Rex is always exciting, but finding one that's almost 40% complete? Let's just say that's a pretty great day for the paleontology community. However, for the Y-Rex, its discovery was only the beginning of our incredible tale. Despite being such an unbelievable find, what makes my friend here even more remarkable was what we didn't find. As you all have probably already noticed, the Y-Rex is missing a pretty large portion of its tail. Which, for dinosaur fossils, isn't all that uncommon. But it's what we learn next that's had some pretty big implications for your favorite dinosaur. So today, we're taking a look at the story of the Y-Rex and discovering how it's completely changed our understanding of the Tyrant Lizard King. Don't forget to hit that like button, and let's dive into this. It's the early 2000s, and we've already been through this. The Y-Rex fossils were discovered by a group of amateur fossil hunters and then later excavated with the help of well-known paleontologist and president of the Black Hills Institute, Peter Larson. After the excavation, the fossils were described as belonging to an adult male tyrannosaur and then put on display at the Houston Museum of Natural Science. Now, as I stated earlier, it's not unusual for fossils to have several missing pieces. As we talked about in my video on the Spinosaurus, most of the fossils we see in museums are jigsaw replicas of several different specimens. Normally, when we find a dinosaur with some missing pieces, for example, the tail, we simply fill in those missing parts with scaled replicas borrowed from one of its friends. This helps paleontologists get a better idea of what these animals actually look like, and it gives visitors a better museum experience. In fact, the Y-Rex is no stranger to this process, as parts of its skull and body are made from the cast of other tyrannosaurs. However, as you can clearly see, that tail is still missing, and as we'll soon discover, that missing tail has some pretty big implications for Tyrannosaurus rex. But before we get to that, let's stop beating around the bush. We all want to know the same thing. What on earth happened to its tail? In truth, that part really isn't a mystery. There are only so many terrestrial animals with jaws large enough to completely bite off the tail of an adult tyrannosaur, and they're all named T-Rex. But that's just the land-based animals. What about those massive marine reptiles such as Mosasaur who dominated the planet's oceans? You know what? It's funny you should mention that. I recently watched Prehistoric Planet and they had a really neat episode where a Mosasaur attacked a T-Rex who was swimming through the water. Could one of these enormous aquatic predators be our culprit? Well, we actually have some pretty good evidence of this. An animal like Mosasaur definitely has the size to do some serious damage to a T-Rex tail. And the Y-Rex was discovered with several prehistoric turtles buried around it. In fact, are those T-Rex bite impressions? Where? On the tail of Y-Rex. Those are definitely T-Rex bite marks. Hmm, you make a very strong argument. Okay, so we're pretty sure that the injury to Y-Rex was caused by another T-Rex. But what's so special about a T-Rex who lost a fight? I like dinosaurs who survive, which is exactly why I like the Y-Rex. As devastating as this injury was, we know that the Y-Rex would have survived this encounter and gone on to, how do we know it survived? Ah, yes, I almost forgot to mention that. Go ahead and take another look at that tail. You'll notice that we see evidence of new bone growth at the tip of the tail. If any of you have ever had the misfortune of breaking a bone, your bone was able to heal itself by creating new bone around the fracture and over time making you as good as new. Unfortunately, dinosaurs are not reptiles, so they can't regrow their limbs. But if they can survive the encounter, they are able to recover from major injuries. We can assume that because the bones of Y-Rex show signs of new growth, it must have lived long enough to recover from its injury. And then it would have gone on to do all sorts of awesome T-Rex stuff, such as hunting and starring in Hollywood blockbusters. I'm just kidding with you all. The Y-Rex couldn't hunt because he's a scavenger. That's only in Montana. No, the Y-Rex couldn't hunt because unfortunately, it could barely walk. The tails of dinosaurs were used for much more than just defense and display. Their tails played a crucial role in balance and stabilization, which makes a lot of sense. After all, the T-Rex has a big head, so it needs a large thick tail to keep it from toppling over. In addition to aiding with balance, the tail also contains several important muscle attachments that connect it to the thigh bone. These muscles play a vital role in allowing the animal to walk, 
by helping to pull its massive legs backward with each step. This means that if the Y-Rex was able to walk at all, it would struggle to stay standing up, it couldn't gain a burst of speed, and it would be incredibly unbalanced. Put simply, the Y-Rex wasn't exactly living its best life after losing its tail. It probably would have had a pretty difficult time surviving. Which then brings us to our next question. If the Y-Rex could barely walk, how did it live long enough to recover from its deadly wounds? Well, the missing tail is only one piece to this incredible puzzle. And thankfully, we have an entire skeleton chock full of awesome stuff to talk about that will help us solve this mystery. So let's talk about my personal favorite aspect of this find, those hands. The Y-Rex has the best preserved hands of any T-Rex we've ever found. It's incredible how well those babies are preserved. When it comes to the T-Rex, we debate stuff like Hunter vs. Scavenger, Nanotyrannus or Juvenile T-Rex, all sorts of stuff. But the one thing we've all known since we are young little monsters is that the T-Rex has a big head and tiny little arms with two small claws at the end of each. Um, what's that? Why does the Y-Rex have a third digit on its hand? Well, remember earlier when I said that museum displays are like jigsaw puzzles? This extra digit is a puzzle piece we've never had before. It turns out that the T-Rex had a third vestigial digit that had never been preserved until the discovery of Y-Rex. So then, does this mean that the T-Rex actually had three fingers? To be honest, I'm not sure. Most likely, that third digit wouldn't have been long enough to protrude and be visible. I think it's more likely that similar to your tailbone, this third digit was completely covered. Still, this discovery is important because it tells us that the ancestors of T-Rex would have had more than two fingers. Okay, now you're just rubbing it in. In addition to the extra digit, the arms of Y-Rex were so well preserved that they're providing paleontologists with a better understanding of how the arms of T-Rex actually moved, and more importantly, what they might have actually been used for. If any of you are curious about what the purpose of those small arms was, then good! Maybe you can help us come up with some theories, because as of right now, it's still a mystery. The hypothesis I like is the one coined by paleontologist Dr. Backer. Since the T-Rex is basically all teeth and claws, having small non-threatening hands would allow two T-Rexes to be intimate with each other. Or as Dr. Backer puts it, they were arms for tickling. It also means that they weren't being used for fisticuffs. So then, if we want to see how the Y-Rex was able to survive, we'll need to look somewhere else. And a great place to look next is not with its skeleton, but within the rock in which it was discovered. Okay, so let's see what we have here. Sea toll remains? That's cool. Rocks? No wait, that's a boulder. Skin impressions? More. Wait, skin impressions? We have skin impressions of a T-Rex? That's so cool! But once again, it's what we don't see that tells us the most interesting story. Look closely. You'll notice that they're covered in scales. Where are all the feathers? For those of us with dinosaurs on the brain, feathers have become a defining characteristic for our favorite theropods. Even though feathers haven't made their way to Hollywood yet, this little monster loves the idea of visualizing dinosaurs as vibrant tropical birds. Or in the case of T-Rex, a giant chicken with teeth. So then, what's going on here? Is my dream of a giant chicken T-Rex gone? Well, kind of, but I don't think we can completely rule out feathers on the T-Rex just yet. But before we get to that, some of you might be wondering, why do we think Tyrannosauruses in general had feathers in the first place? Easy because we've already found them. Not on the skin impressions of the T-Rex, but on some of its younger cousins such as Euteranus. Euteranus was a small Tyrannosaurid discovered in northern China. The fossil bed where the animal was found remains one of the best examples of preserved feathers in a large theropod that paleontologists have ever found. And it has provided strong evidence that the other species of Tyrannosaurus were also covered in feathers. So what does that mean for the star of this video? Well, despite the fact that these are both species of Tyrannosaurus, as you can clearly see here, they are very different animals. But what does size have to do with whether or not the T-Rex had feathers or not? The evolution of feathers is a complex topic. Some paleontologists believe that one of their early functions would have been for thermal regulation. When it comes to thermal regulation, size can solve a lot of your problems. And much like other large animals such as whales and mosasaur, the T-Rex wouldn't necessarily have needed feathers to keep warm. In addition to their size, both animals lived in vastly different ecosystems. Do any of you remember when we used to have seasons? Well, Euteranus remembers. Euteranus lived during the early Cretaceous period in a temperate forest environment. They would have experienced mild temperatures with moderate rainfall and lots of diversity in plants. Think desktop background. In comparison, the T-Rex lived in areas such as coastal plains and river valleys during the late Cretaceous period. Basically, think of swamplands. Their environment was much hotter with far fewer trees and lots of humidity. Imagine yourself in this setting. The sun is blazing, the ground is wet, and there's very little shade to escape the heat. Ask yourself, would a thick coat of feathers be beneficial to you, or would you prefer something lighter? It's no contest. If I'm a T-Rex, and I drew this one here, I'm wearing something that breathes a little. But does this mean that they had no feathers at all? Personally, I don't think so. I think just like you humans have very little hair compared to your primate brothers, the T-Rex would have had feathers along its body. But napkin, 
We have skin impressions. Doesn't this make this an open and shut case? Well, that's where you're wrong. We don't have a skin impression of T-Rex. We have several. However, I left out a very important detail here. All of these skin impressions are really tiny. For the Y-Rex, these skin impressions we've been looking at are roughly 3 to 4 centimeters in diameter. Other skin impressions from cousins of T-Rex, such as Albertosaurus, are larger, but the location of all these skin impressions leaves a lot of room for speculation. In fact, if you're a fan of the scavenger hypothesis, this kind of makes them look like a turkey vulture. I have to admit, I really like this picture. After all, I drew it. But the image of feathers on T-Rex is something I want to hold on to. That said, if I'm being honest with myself, it's starting to look like many of the large theropods were covered in scales and at most would have had a few small quill-like feathers spread throughout their body. Which makes me excited to see the next generation of paleo art for T-Rex. Anyways, let's get back to the Y-Rex and how it managed to survive without the ability to hunt or defend its territory. So how did it do it? The shorter answer is, it couldn't. It couldn't chase down prey, it couldn't handle territory disputes from another Tyrannosaur, it couldn't do all the things that T-Rexes love to do. But do you know who could do all that? It's buddies! The Tyrannosaurus rex has historically been viewed as a loner, chasing down its prey across the rugged landscape before finally chowing down. Seriously? Nowhere is safe! It's occupied! However, paleontological evidence suggests that this idea is heavily outdated. Finding complete Tyrannosaurus skeletons is rare, but we have discovered several fossil beds with multiple T-Rexes living together, such as the Death Gulch site in Montana where remains of three sub-adult Tyrannosauruses were discovered in the early 20th century. We've also discovered dinosaur trackways with multiple Tyrannosaurs all moving in the same direction at the same time. And of course, we have the Y-Rex, an animal that by every metric should be able to survive, and yet somehow managed to live long enough to recover from its fatal injury. On top of that, the Y-Rex shows evidence of something that none of these other Tyrannosaur finds shows. The current idea is that as juveniles, T-Rexes might have participated in pack hunting, working together as they hunt and scavenge for food before finally settling off on their own once they reach adulthood. Some paleontologists even think that this behavior might have extended into adulthood and that the T-Rex was a pack animal. But do you know what the Y-Rex couldn't do? Any of that. Which means this isn't simply evidence of group behavior. Instead, this is evidence of communal behavior. These animals were not simply working together to find food. They were living in a group and taking care of each other. Y-Rex's survival for such an extended period of time was likely due to its family members bringing it food and water, showcasing a remarkable level of social support within the Tyrannosaur group. This level of care suggests a sophisticated social structure where the survival of the individual was tied to the collective efforts of the group. This paints a very different picture for our friend here. Rather than being solitary hunters, it's possible that T-Rexes were social animals who developed long-term family bonds with each other. Now, it's important to note that not all paleontologists agree with this theory. There is just as much, if not more, fossil evidence that suggests the T-Rexes were indeed solitary hunters. We've seen several trackways of a single Tyrannosaur tracking down large prey, and of course there's the famous 2006 find of both the Tyrannosaurus Rex and a Triceratops locked in a battle to the death. You have to imagine that if there were other Tyrannosaurs standing there, one of them would have helped themselves to some of the leftovers. Or at the very least, maybe help out its friend a little. Speaking of which, I always thought that Triceratops lived in large herds. So then, where were all of its buddies when their friend was being attacked? Herbivores often get all the credit for being in these loving social environments, but when push comes to shove, they are no-shows. This poor Triceratops probably had its whole life ahead of it too. I mean, just look at it. I have to say, I really do love the Triceratops. Everything about them screams iconic dinosaur. They have those incredible horns, that magnificent head crust, and of course, we can't forget that beak. Yep, everything about them is, wait a second, what on earth are those things? Oh, the quills? Those are actually part of a very exciting discovery where paleontologists discovered that the Triceratops, hey, would you look at that? Unfortunately, we're out of time. So I guess we'll have to leave the story of this incredible Triceratops for another video. Until then, I want to thank you all for watching. If you enjoyed this video and want to see more, please consider subscribing to my channel. And don't forget to bring snacks.